Good evening, and welcome to After the Verdict, Reflections on an Unfinished Struggle for Racial Justice. My name is Alex Bird. I'm Associate Professor of History and Vice Provost for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. I won't presume to pronounce recent events as a watershed in American history or African-American history or the history of justice and injustice in our world. Scholars have had to rescue and foreground too many once important and later neglected, potentially era-defining moments. But there is no denying that in the aftermath and the conviction of Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd, that institutions like ours should pause and reflect and converse with one another about what just happened and about its potential significance and about what it means to us individually and collectively. And so that's what our community will do here now, um, maybe continuing conversations that many in the audience have already um, begun. Uh, and I also know that these conversations um, will not end with this webinar this evening. Um, but we are extraordinarily glad to have you here with us tonight, um, where we'll hear from members of our community um, about their reactions to the trial, to the conviction, to the larger moment of which it was a part. We'll hear, we'll hear from them from the perspective of uh, policing in America, from the perspective of uh, athletics uh, in the United States, from the perspective of our criminal justice system, from the perspective of university life uh, and scholarship, and, 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 and many other um, vantage points. Um, an event like this that comes together uh, in, in less than a day um, can only happen with a, a lot of people uh, involved. Uh, some of them you'll hear from, many of them who are really important to it it's happening, you'll hear from over the course of the evening. Um, but many more of them you won't see. And I want to take a moment and thank them now before we begin. Um, tonight's event is organized by Bridge uh, and the Center for African and African American Studies uh, and Circle. Uh, and the task force, uh, and I will um, enter um, those details in the in in the chat as we as we go on, so you'll know who's um, behind this. Um, but we also have to thank the office um, of the president, the office of the provost, uh, and the people in the office of university public affairs, um, especially Jeff Cox, Ryan Kirksey, and John Paul Estrada. Uh, who worked um, really quickly on all the details um, of tonight. Um, after you hear from me, you'll hear from uh, our speakers, uh, and I will introduce them shortly. Um, they will speak for five to seven minutes uh, on the topic at hand. Um, after they are finished, um, Professor Faye Yarbrough, um, who is Associate Professor of History and Associate Dean of Humanities, um, will manage a, a Q&A, um, asking questions of, our, of her own to the panelists, um, but also managing your questions, um, which we invite you to put in the Q&A um, over the course uh, of the webinar. Um, um, so now I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, um, many of them are, are here already. Some of them um, will have to join late. Uh, and so you'll see them uh, pop in uh, as the webinar unfolds. Um, I'm delighted that we have with us today, JP Abercrombie, Associate Athletics Director, Matthew Hayes, Assistant Professor of Political Science, 
Angela Gilmore, Assistant Director of Facilities Engineering and Planning, Akila Mance, Rice Class of 2005, uh, an attorney here in Houston, Danny Perdue, Rice 2021, um, will be um, given her PhD degree in mechanical engineering this year, um, former president of the Black Graduate Student Association and vice president of the Graduate Student Association. Um, Kendall Vining, Rice 2022, um, our current student association president. Um, Robert Worth, senior lecturer in the Department of Sociology. Uh, and Faye Yarbrough, uh, who I've already introduced as our moderator. Um, we're also joined on the panel by Dr. Anthony Penn, uh, who is professor um, of religious studies and director of the Center for African and African American Studies. Uh, and so now we'll begin our remarks. And so I'd like to invite um, Akila Mance to get us started. Thank you so much, Dr. Bird, and thank you to all the different departments and centers and, and folks at Rice who worked to put this event together. Um, I know that I was expected to bring this sort of uh, in-depth legal analysis, and I hate to disappoint. Um, I won't be doing that tonight, but I, I do want to start from a very basic place, and um, that's from a perspective of being a human being, a person, um, a Black person in America. And I think watching cases like this unfold are definitely um, traumatic, stressful, and can even be depressing. And we all handle those emotions differently. You know, you might refuse to ever click on a news headline like this again. You may be numb, you may be angry, you may be moved to action, you may never uh, view the criminal justice system positively, regardless of what the outcome um, is here today. And I think the verdict yesterday was a relief for many because at a fundamental level, a person who committed a crime was held accountable by the justice system. Um, and for anybody who you know may disagree with that statement, I'll say what you know has been often said when the outcome is the other way, and that is respect the jury's verdict. Um, and I know that this was made even more impactful because the defendant in this case was a sworn police officer who committed this act in front of the world um, and in the course of his duties. And that adds so many different emotions and complicated histories of racial injustice and, and trauma. Um, the verdict may have been a celebration for some, even though that emotion was likely fleeting. Uh, because I learned a long time ago, you don't get too high or too low in these verdicts because the daily grind of making the legal system work fairly and equally for all people is unending. Um, but this verdict yesterday was an example of the system working as intended and as it relates to this defendant. Uh, I, I want to be clear, the system did not work for Mr. Floyd uh, because the jury made that clear in a legal sense. He lost his life and his loved ones uh, will never be made whole regardless of the outcome yesterday. Um, but when people say the system worked, they, they're talking about fundamental aspects of the criminal justice system upheld the legal principles that we espouse all the time due process, equal treatment under the law, a jury of your peers, a fair and impartial court, a prosecutor pursuing justice based on the law and the evidence. All of those things are important. And um, the ongoing work in racial injustice in the criminal system is simply holding America to its own systems. I mean, you can travel all around the world and find countries and nations that don't espouse those principles, but we do here. And I think that ongoing work is just a work to make sure that those principles are being upheld um, in our country. So just to think a little bit about this case, and I'll try to hit this really quickly so that I'm respectful of everybody's time, but I've heard a lot of aspects of this case be highlighted as working in this situation. So what does that mean 
starting with the prosecutors who handled this case. Recall, it wasn't prosecuted by the county prosecutor. It was uh, prosecuted by the attorney general and his staff and special prosecutors. And what does that mean? How do you even get prosecutors in a position to actually um, do the right thing? That starts by voting. Prosecutors in this country, in most places are elected, particularly at the state and local election. Um, I, I've known many colleagues and friends who have won or lost judicial uh, DA elections by a couple of hundred, maybe a thousand. That's no more than the campus uh, of Rice University. That's more, no more than a few dorms. So you have to vote and you have to be involved and you have to make sure that those people are in office. That's the same for judges. We elect our judges. And so many people will stop at the top of, top of the ticket and never actually um, make sure that we're voting in judges who will hold a fair and impartial trial. And lastly, um, jurors. You had 12 people who showed up. They uh, did their civic duty and they followed the law and the evidence of, despite what was going on. Can't tell you how many times I've had friends, you know, text and call and say, got a jury summons, how can I get out of this? Or what do I need to say to get off the jury? I'm like, clearly you don't know, uh, <laughs> you know, my perspective on the conversation, but you know, we need people to show up for those jury summons, to actually participate in jury selection, to serve on grand juries. Um, all of those things had to go right in this circumstance for us even to get to the outcome that we have today. So um, I look forward to continuing to discuss uh, the conversation and, and thank you for letting me kick this off. Thank you. We'll now hear from Professor Hayes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bird, and thank you, uh, everyone, for, for being here. Uh, I want to echo a lot of Akila's points. I think she raises um, something interesting to think about, how many things had to go right to get this outcome, which is really the bare minimum for any sense of justice. In addition to what she's outlined, you had to have people on scene taking video evidence of the, the murder of George Floyd. You had to, they were pleading for his life. We had an entire summer with some of the most uh, massive protests, peaceful protests in this country's history, something we haven't seen since the late 1960s. Um, you had an attorney general in um, Keith Ellison in Minnesota who was willing to prosecute Derek Chauvin instead of reach a plea agreement. Um, all of those things had to go right. If any one of those things wasn't in place, I think we don't see this, this outcome. Uh, and this is especially problematic, not just for justice for the, the Floyd family, but for what it means for the broader system. We're currently in a system where African-American people in this country do not have trust in the police. They do not have trust in the criminal justice system and for good reason. So we need to start rebuilding that trust. Without it, any time we have an instance of police using deadly force on a black suspect, there are going to be suspicions of the motives. We saw as the Chauvin verdict was being announced, uh, a black child was killed by police in Columbus, Ohio, right? It's regrettable that these things ever have to happen. Sometimes police do have to use deadly force. And in those instances, it's really critical that we have trust in the political system. Without it, people won't trust the, the procedures that are used to reach an outcome. They won't trust the outcome itself, and it will just cycle into more and more protest and unrest until the system changes. So what can we do? Um, I think Akilah hit the, the nail on the head, right? It starts with voting, um, registering to vote. Texas is a state where it's very difficult to register to vote, but it's really critical. Um, uh, logs of registered voters are where jury pools in most, of, most parts of this country are drawn from. So it's critical to register to vote and turn out to vote. Not only that, you can't vote only every two years. Many of these uh, judgeships, these attorney generals, are elected in off-year elections, elections that no one is paying attention to. So if we think about Keith Ellison, he was elected in 2018 um, during a, a midterm election. If we think about Breonna Taylor in Kentucky, the Kentucky attorney general is elected off cycle. He's elected in, I think, 2019. Uh, very few people participate in these elections. And if we don't show up, 
we can't hold elected officials accountable for reaching systems for reaching decisions that work for all citizens. Um, I think it's also important to, to realize that the, the struggle doesn't end here. All of the hard work that people put in this summer, protesting, taking to the streets, putting their lives at risk in the middle of a pandemic to ensure that elected officials took this seriously, that has to continue. Research from political scientists, um, in particular Omar Wasau at, at Princeton, shows that nonviolent protests work. The more people take to the streets, the more responsive uh, elected officials and public opinion is to the plight of African-Americans. But that's not easy, right? You're asking people to put their lives on the line to change a system that doesn't work for them. That's a big ask. Um, and so I think it's important to have this two-pronged strategy to focus both on, on voting and getting people into office who will listen to protesters, who will listen to people who are victimized by the criminal justice system, as well as continuing, um, as well as continuing to protest. Um, in my own research, I found that uh, in order to be satisfied with outcomes, it's not enough to receive uh, an outcome that's favorable, right? It's also important to have procedures that people view as fair. This is what's called procedural justice. So in order for these decisions to be perceived as fair and equitable, we need not only for police officers to be held accountable, but for African-Americans and for communities that are over-policed to have a seat at the table. They need to be involved in police decision-making. They need to be involved in juries. They need to be involved in local government so that we know when there are these injustices built into the system, that there are people who are willing to speak out for those issues. I think that's the only way um, that we can start to address these underlying concerns and start to move towards a country that lives up to its ideals of equality and justice for all. So thank you for, for um, allowing me to be here. I look forward to hearing everyone else's comments. Thank you so much, Dr. Hayes. We'll now hear from JB, JP Abercrombie. Thank you, Dr. Bird, and to everyone who's had a role in this conversation and really creating the space. I think for me, that's where my role in this really starts, creating spaces for our students, for our coaches, for members of our community to, to feel like they are seen, they are valued, uh, they are listened to and not just heard. And so as I'm still very much processing the events of not only yesterday, the last three weeks of the trial, the last year, the last 16 months, my life as a black woman in this country, uh, I wanna focus on intersections and accountability. And I think for my role, when I talk about intersections, I have the unique role of working in our athletic department, but also at, at the intersection of college athletics and higher ed in general, athletics and higher ed. And so as, as much as I'm watching what is going on in higher ed, I'm also looking to professional sports leagues to see what's going on. When everything was shut down in 2020, it's no secret that athletics and particularly the role of professional athletes played a big role in the movements that we saw over the summer, particularly the WNBA, the NBA, MLS. You saw NFL kind of uh, come into the picture as they upstarted their season. You saw things with Major League Baseball as well. So athlete activism has been at an all-time high. As we think about my role in the department, my focus has been on creating spaces for our student athletes to feel what they feel, to process those feelings, but then ultimately to, to create the space for them to, to talk through that, to work through that and be able to show up to be their best student athlete and self every day. And for many of them, that athletic identity is at the intersection of a racial or ethnic identity that puts them in the other category, could be a gender identity that puts them in another category or even um, a, a, another status or academic classification that may put them as an other. So layering all of these intersections of identities and trying to figure out the support stru structures, the support systems that our students need, or even those that our coaches need is not a simple task. And I can do that, or I need to do that. I have the responsibility of doing that as a woman who has multiple layers of intersections of identities that are often viewed as being disenfranchised as well. And so to carry that every day into a space that is not necessarily seen for me or favorably to people who look like me, 
um, that's, that's another burden or another layer of accountability in this process that I have to be aware of when we talk about creating the space. If I focus on the last three weeks, um, I wanna think about our student athletes and our students on this campus, acknowledging where they are in the academic year. It is no secret that we are coming up to the close of the year. And so final projects uh, for many student athletes, that also includes uh, postseason. We just saw our soccer team win their championship at home. Uh, and as they get prepared to head out to NCAAs, we still have a few other teams that are in season. How are we supporting them? How are we allowing them to, to show up as their full selves um, and not even focus on the athletic activism part, focus on the student identity, focus on their personal identity. How, how do they identify with what's going on in the world? How do we as an athletic department support them in all of their holistic identity so that they can be the best selves that they wanna be? That's a daunting task. And I say that as a person who has had to try and navigate that um, for myself while also creating space for so many others to process their own feelings, to think about what this verdict means, the layers of justice or injustice that we are facing every day for a variety of, of identities. So as I walked around our department yesterday and many people were rejoicing the verdict, they said they proclaimed justice. For me, that was accountability. I don't know if I can go as far as saying justice because as Professor Hayes mentioned, there, there are many systems in this country that may not view me in particular, but also many of my students, many of our community members as being worthy of equality, being worthy of fairness, being worthy of justice. So when I think about the work that we have to do behind the scenes to prepare, to brace for an unfavorable verdict or an outcome that was different than what we know to be the truth today, that's, <laughs> it's an unfortunate reality to, to, to think about, you know, who are those people in your community who are behind you or beside you? Is our well-being and counseling center prepared for this? Are the coaches prepared to facilitate a conversation? Are there going to be academic accommodations? What are all of the what ifs? And those were things that we were proactively trying to plan so that it wasn't this, what do we do? What I don't know how to support the students. We have to be there for them, but we also have to be there for ourselves. And I think about that in terms of how we work across this campus and how we create a community that is fostered on this, ex this idea of excellence and what it means for each of us to, to work toward inclusive excellence. I wanted to be a part of this conversation to echo the sentiments that our work is just really beginning in a new chapter. Because for me, yesterday was a sign of restored hope, but also a, a reminder that we have a long way to go. The events that were happening in Chicago and Columbus and Indianapolis have been referenced uh, in many stretches of the imagination on this call and as well as in, in other forums beyond uh, the space. But I wanna make sure that people know that the energy that we had in June and July and August, the frustration, the activism, the protests that we saw in the fall, keep that same energy because we still have a long way to go. But there are so many other things that are going on in this world today uh, specifically to our, for our students as they try to wrap up their year, as they try to focus on graduation, maybe even a dissertation or two coming out. I don't know if we're going to talk about that, but those are things that we all have to carry as we have other responsibilities. This is just one facet of our identity. So when we think about the layers of work that come into showing up in this space to executing that job, I'm personally not asking for any favors, but I love to have to be a part of a community where people acknowledge that, where there's an awareness, where we are actively trying to dismantle those systems of oppression to truly create inclusive excellence and embody our institutional values in the best ways for each and every member of our community. Thank you so much, JP. Um, before we hear from Professor Worth, I want to remind uh, the those of you in the audience that when a question comes to mind, you can go ahead and put it in the Q&A and um, Dr. Yarbrough will have uh, access to it when, when we get to that part of the program. We'll, we'll now hear from Professor Worth. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Bird, for that. To my fellow panelists, to everybody who made this possible, uh, I'm glad we're having this conversation. Um, 
I was relieved at the verdict. And I think many of us were, or many people were. And I hope George Floyd's family and friends find some small measure of solace in this verdict. Although it remains to be seen if the other three police officers involved end up being convicted of aiding and abetting. But I think solace is the word that is most fitting here because in news stories and social media posts, I've seen celebratory comments and I've seen a number of comments mentioning justice. For instance, saying that someone is relieved or glad that justice was achieved for George Floyd and his family. But this verdict does not represent justice. Justice would be George Floyd alive. Justice would be George Floyd thriving in life. So I think it's time for us to expand our conception of justice and to decouple it from what we commonly call the criminal justice system, right? Which is neither a system nor is it about justice. What we have is a policing and punishment system, or rather a large constellation of institutions tasked with policing and punishing. And these institutions direct their attention differentially, in fact, very unequally within our society. There are certain individuals, certain neighborhoods, and certain groups that are targeted much, much more by the police and by the institution, institutions of punishment, but I'll, I'll come back to that in just a moment. But one thing I wanna say is there, there are discussions and disagreements going on right now about, on the one hand, doing this case is reflective of a sea change or that this case could help bring about once in a lifetime police reform. But then on the other hand, uh, uh, discussions or comments about viewing this case, this verdict as an outlier, as a flash in the pan, as the exception that proves the rule. But what I wanna do is provide just a little context on police, on some policing statistics and some of the history of police, all very briefly, of course, but I think they're, they're important to contextualize in our discussion. So first, there are more than 18,000 state and local law enforcement agencies in the United States with over 700,000 sworn officers, right? And this actually excludes private security and private security guards and forces, which are nearly as numerous as public police. But we spend on public police $126 billion per year on the police. And each year, the police make more than 10 million arrests. And 1 million people of those experience either the threat of force or actual force each year. And an even less known statistic about police is that most policing has little to do with real threats to public safety. Only 5% of the arrests that police make are for a serious violent offense. The vast majority of police arrests are for what we would call quote unquote low level offenses. In fact, only about half of policing even involves the criminal law. The other half is for traffic control, civil disputes and administrative law. And then some statistics specifically on police killings. Roughly the same number of people are killed by police each year, year after year for about 10 years running, and roughly the same number of police officers are charged with homicide or manslaughter each year. And less than 2% of on-duty police officers who kill someone are ever charged with a crime. In fact, we learned from the New York Times yesterday that since 2005, there have been 50 in the United States, there have been 15,000 police killings and only seven police officers convicted of homicide or manslaughter. So 15,000 killings, only seven individuals convicted. And while police officers kill individuals of all races, they do not do so equally. They kill black and brown individuals at rates much higher than they kill white individuals. They kill Native Americans at the highest rate and then African Americans at the second highest rate. So those are some of the statistics that I wanted to mention. And now just a little bit of history uh, of modern police. And by modern police, I mean the state-based institution that includes uniformed salaried police officers that are focused on preventing and solving crimes. So the modern police from their very inception have been more focused on policing marginalized and subjugated people. In Europe and England, the newly created modern police force were directed and, and focused especially on the poor and what we today call the working classes. The police's job or principal job was to surveil, regulate, and if necessary, arrest members of this group in order to help turn them into willing and productive factory workers in the newly created capitalist economy. 
And in the United States, the, the modern police formed first not in cities like Philadelphia, New York, or Boston in the north, they formed in southern states. The modern police first came to the US in the southern states where they were centrally focused on slaves especially what they considered, quote unquote, rebellious slaves or escaped slaves. And then after the end of slavery, policing continued its focus, but on the former slave. So essentially since its inception, policing has been an institution and a project that focused much of its attention on marginalized subjugated people. And to a considerable degree, we see that continuing even in the current day. And one other thing to add to this history is, is looking beyond the police, just at the culture of the United States, there's a long history in the US of associating blackness and criminality, right? Viewing African-Americans as more prone to engage in crime, is more likely to, to represent a threat to public safety. Now this history has been well documented and written by numerous scholars. And as philosopher Judith Butler notes, the history on one hand of empowering police to use violence and on the, on the other hand of associating blackness with criminality, those two things together are the conditions of possibility of what we are now seeing every day with the killings of George Floyd, Trayvon Martin, Breonna Taylor, Michael Brown, Freddie Gray. We could continue and actually many of the names are much less publicly known, right? So coming back to this verdict, this case and this verdict, historically speaking, is very much of an outlier, right? As this brief history I give helps highlight, and some of the previous panelists have noted elements that make it an outlier as well. But I think uh, an important question is, will this case be an outlier moving forward or not, right? History doesn't give me very many reasons for optimism, but history doesn't determine everything. History doesn't have the final say on what the future holds because uh, as again, as a few people have mentioned since 2015 in the United States, we're in a period that's seen growing attention, dissatisfaction and anger in our current system of policing and punishment and calls for police reforms. But even more than that, we're seeing calls for defunding and disinvesting in police and investing in communities, investing in people, investing in overlooked, marginalized, subjugated communities and neighborhoods in particular. We're even seeing calls to abolish the police. Right, So this hasn't yet led to any significant changes, but the fact that the discussions, calls, and demands are happening means something, right? But as Monica Bell, a sociology and law professor at Yale said yesterday or wrote last night in Politico, it is critical that we do not allow this outcome of this particular trial to lure us into complacency. Right? And then the last thing I'll say, because I think I'm still within time yeah, for one more minute, uh, last thing I'll say is I've seen comments that this, that this verdict shows no one is above the law. Joe Biden, even President Biden even said that last night. And on one level, yes, it does show us that Derek Chauvin, a police officer, is not above the law. But you know what we don't talk about as much is the inverse side of this saying of people being below the law. But we know that many people are frequently and repeatedly placed below the law, are conceived and treated as if they don't deserve the same legal rights and protections. Now, historically, this has included African Americans, uh, women, indigenous people, Japanese Americans, etc. But today we see it happening many, many times. For instance, in each case where charges are brought against a police officer, but no conviction was obtained, in these cases, the victim and their family members are placed below the below the law. Or in every case in which police engage in brutality, they're placing their victims as below the law. It's not worthy. So I am happy that, that Derek Chauvin was not placed above the law, but we still repeatedly in our society place many, many people below the law, and that has to be addressed equally. And I think that is where I will wrap up. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Thanks very much, Dr. Worth. We'll now hear from the very soon to be um, Dr. Perdue. Hi, Dr. Bird. Thank you. Um, I am here. Thank you for having this panel and thank you for inviting me to be here. One of the things that I was uh, as a suggestion to talk about and reflect on is being Black in scholarship. 
And so I defended my um, dissertation um, on April 8th and it was a very great accomplishment. And whenever I think about the scholarship that I've had over these last zillions of years, it feels like, um, I think about just like expectations. And I think about how there are expectations while you're in school, while you're black and in school to either not meet expectations or you need to exceed expectations. And I know that I felt that pressure a lot throughout school of wanting to excel and wanting to be the best that I can, but not always just the best that I can in general, just for me, but for like my race or my gender and what I represent. And so that weighs very heavily on, it weighed very heavily on me um, and it's kind of anxiety inducing. Um, and so I put a lot of work and effort and energy into trying to change my environment around me to make it be more inclusive for myself. And um, there's a lot of work that you know, still needs to be done within academia, but I wanna talk a little bit about the tug of war that I know I felt internally and some of my uh, peers felt internally when dealing with protests. We've all talked about how effective protests can be and we do need to keep up the momentum that JP was talking about. And we also need to not become complacent. There was a similar, this type of relief that we feel from the, the results of yesterday is, reminds me of the relief that we felt, I felt whenever Barack Obama became president. It's like, oh, okay, great, this is awesome. But we still had so much more work to do. And so the tug of war I was mentioning is about this, um, I'm in STEM, I'm a mechanical engineer. And I know that there were times whenever there were protests for Trayvon Martin that I spent some of the day protesting, but I knew I had to go back and study. Or whenever there was protests and die-ins, you guys remember those, for Mike Brown, I, I went some for a little bit of time, but then I had to go back and study. And I remember looking out the window, the library, and seeing everyone marching, and I just hated the fact that I couldn't be out there. I hated that I couldn't do more because I felt the responsibility to meet the expectations of exceeding high to exceeding well academically for this test that I had coming up or a presentation that I had. And so as happy as I am to see that these results happened the way that I know I personally wanted things to go, it also reminds me of me trying to still navigate like where I belong and how am I going to make the most uh, impact, right? Am I making a large impact by being in scholarship, by being a scholar? Am I making enough impact by, you know, not doing, not sitting for the test and going to go march? And so this um, uphill battle that I have, uh, especially as someone in STEM, I can't speak about anybody in, in any, any other area, but I know that it's rare to see a black person in STEM and it's rare to see a black woman in mechanical engineering specifically. And I've always kind of just wondered like, what is my place in the world? And some people have encouraged me, mentors have said, Danny, you're doing a lot by just being who you are and doing what you're doing. But that was always really challenging for me to accept because I always wanted to do more. Um, and when it comes to expectations, you want to meet people's expectations. And you know, in order to be considered serious, you have to exceed people's expectations, which was a huge push as to why I did get a PhD because so many people had doubted me along the path through my education that I wasn't technically sound or intellectually curious. Um, and so I find myself now still trying to like fill a void, I guess, like how do I please you know, my people, right? And protest in March, how do I appease my mentors who are telling me that I can't exceed greatness? How do I appease uh, myself and just trying to do well, but also following my heart? And so I just wanted to send encouragement to anybody who kind of feels similarly the way that I do, um, is that you just do the best you can with what you have, do well in it, and do what you believe that you should be doing. And so um, if that means that you stay and study, feel content that you're not letting down a whole group of people just because you decided to stay in and study. If you decide that, you know what, I already have an A in this class and we just have a quiz tomorrow, I'm gonna go out and do the protest, then go ahead and do the protest. You know, just do whatever you think is going to help you feel fulfilled and portraying the mission and purpose that you have for your life. So I just wanna end with that.
Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Danny. We'll, we'll now hear from Angela Gilmore. Well, thank you, Alex. Um, and thank you for um, allowing me to participate. Um, in, in May, when George Floyd died, um, I, I thought this is different, mostly because my 16 year old daughter who you know had been alive when all of these other black men had been killed by police, never really noticed, she noticed this time, right? And she's, she's, she's angry and she's going to the protest. She's doing all of these things. And I'm, I'm thinking this is wonderful. You know, it's, it's gonna be a change, but then it occurs to me that we're in a pandemic. This is happening. Um, and he is different because people are at home watching. And I slowly kind of fall back into this, this cynical place that I don't want to be in, but I, but I am in because I have watched Fernando Castile, Tamir Wright, Rodney King in 1991, killed on camera and nothing happened. So this time I didn't watch the trial because I, I couldn't. I couldn't do it mostly because I followed the Trayvon Martin case very, very closely. And I was shocked that um, George Zimmerman got off, right? He's just a regular guy off the street. He gets away with this. So certainly um, George Floyd's murder is, is going to get away with it. So I refused to be disappointed again. And I did not, did not follow the trial. Um, so I'll say, um, am, am I relieved at the, at the verdict? Um, I, I have very mixed feelings about the verdict, to be very honest. Um, I, I, I think it's wonderful that, that this happened. My, my hope is, is that it's not, you know, a, a one-time thing and everything goes back to normal and we continue to kill people in the street and no one notices when everybody goes back to work. Um, um, I, 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 my, my concern is, is that this trial and this verdict will be similar to the idea that, you know, Obama's president, so now racism is dead. Everything's fine now. I think that I'm, I'm watching and I listen to a lot of conservative talk radio um, where, you know, th they're, they're now talking about, okay, well now you should be happy. There's a, a tweet that I saw where there's, you know, a, a woman that is, is talking about how, you know, you, you got the verdict, you know, everything's fine now, you know, you should be happy. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, is that the police are hunting people of color and I cannot be happy until I know that that is going to stop. And I think the only way that can stop is if we continue the conversation, if we pull our heads out of the sand Take some, take, take some leads from the students that um, are, are so active. This generation is doing such a better job at, at being involved in protesting and making sure that the conversation continues so much better than my generation did, so much better than my mother's um, generation. And I just hope um, that, that we can continue. Um, Right after George Floyd died, I actually called um, one of my supervisors. Um, it's the first time I've ever had a conversation about, about race um, with this person. And, and I, I'm slowly kind of building a relationship with this person and having these kind of personal conversations um, with this person. Um, my department actually started, I'm with Facilities Engineering and Planning. Um, my department actually created a position, the Diversity Inclusion Program um, Director position. Um, and and one, of, one of the things I'm charged with in that position is to continue the conversation no matter how uncomfortable it is. So um, my hope is, is that we don't walk away from this verdict thinking everything's fine, racism is dead, um, because it, it's, it's just not. Um, until we can stop having these panel conversations, until we can stop protesting, it, it, it's still there and we need to keep talking about it. Thanks, Angela. Just wanna remind people again that go ahead and get your questions in the chat. Um, we're rounding the corner on our, our last uh, speaker who is Kendall Vining, the president of the Rice University Student Association. 
Thank you, Dr. Bird. Um, thanks for having me here. Hi, everyone. Just to quickly introduce myself, my name is Kendall, and I'm currently a third year undergrad student at Rice. I plan to go to law school at some point post graduation, and I've been a part of co organizing and aiding in many diversity, equity, inclusion, or DEI, and pro black efforts on and off campus. Um, some of which include co-organizing the Rice for Black Life fundraiser um, last summer that raised almost $100,000 to support grassroots organizations around Houston after the murder of George Floyd, helping to gather students for and TA a pilot DEI course at Rice, co-facilitating the organization of and release of the Rice Black Student Demands, and running for and being elected to the position I currently serve as, um, the Rice Student Association president under a term focus of anti-racism. So not saying all of this for clout purposes, but I thought it was necessary to reveal my background um, and a passion for subjects like these since I have some thoughts to share from a student perspective, from a student leader perspective, from an organizer perspective, from one black woman's perspective. Um, but I want to start by sharing what's going on through my mind from just a human perspective. And I thought about starting this way after I went to class today, actually a class that um, Dr. Worth teaches. Um, because as much as I do have some theories and opinions about what this verdict means, about whether this verdict represents or initiates justice, I also feel like it's important to acknowledge the very human reaction I experienced, which is that when the verdict was relieved, I felt relieved. And I know that it sounds pretty brutal and maybe like feeding into the guise of revenge, but to see Chauvin taken away in cuffs and to see his eyes flicking around and his eyebrows raising in confusion at each of the three guilties, it made me feel good. Like he got what he deserved. And like, not only was this the right decision, but the only decision that could have been made. Yet, as much as I do believe that this was the only decision, I knew that there was this very real possibility that this could have gone a completely other way. Um, was disappointed in the past with the Trayvon Martin case. Because of that, I was prepared and preparing for the worst. I was preparing myself mentally by just thinking it probably will end how it usually does. So all you can do now is think about what you can do after this to heal and to help others heal who will be most harmed by this. A very negative way of thinking, I know, but every Black person develops their own way of dealing with racial trauma. And for me, that means expecting the worst so that I can mentally prepare for surviving future harm. And part of that mental preparation was so that I could help my fellow students, my peers, as they received news of the verdict. You know, yesterday I was speaking with the SA Director of Equity, Krithika Shamana, about the letter and resources we were going to send out to students after the verdict was released, completely assuming that it was not going to be the outcome that it ended up as. And so after hearing the verdict, that plan changed. But even though the verdict thankfully wasn't what I expected, doesn't mean I wasn't happy. Like I mentioned earlier, I felt relieved after the verdict and I still do. Yet I know that there is a huge question regarding what this verdict represents. Was this justice? Was this a sign that the system is working? For some people like me, it's not. Perhaps it's a sign that this is what maybe should be the norm but it's not the norm. So then that leads me to think, okay, maybe it's more of the fire needed to ignite change. Or like what I've been leaning more towards recently, maybe it's what we need to see to show just how rare the good outcomes are and to highlight perhaps the need for a complete uprooting of the system and all of its cognates. But for me, I'm still processing the verdict. I have a lot of questions, I have a lot of thoughts, and a part of the stage that I'm at now is just a tiny bit celebratory. I think that we have time to say this was a good step, but, or this is just one outcome, but 
we have time for that. But I think that it's okay to at least take a day or two for those of us who do feel relieved to breathe that sigh of relief. I don't know yet what that relief stems from for me, whether I agree with some who think this was justice or agree with others who believe this was just a start, but I have time, we have time to analyze further. You know, we have time to reflect. I believe that there is validity to critiquing those who are quick to celebrate or who celebrate for what we may believe is premature or naive, but there is also a necessity to celebrating the wins when we can get them, when we view them as wins. Considering that a lot of people doing the questioning are those in positions of privilege, lawyers, academics, elite college students, regardless of race. And I have more thoughts about that, but um, we could probably talk about that later. But the point is that, you know, students like me who have been hearing from some Rice alumni about why the ongoing presence of Willie's statue does not or should not make me feel unsafe on campus. Students like me who have been working throughout this year to educate our peers, our communities on the realities of anti-Blackness in America um, and how that affects us at Rice. You know, we've been working hard and we've been feeling drained, exhausted and starting to lose hope. And I can say that as a fact and not just as a belief. Um, as I've been a part of a lot of these organizing efforts and some of the ongoing efforts that we're tired, we're starting to lose hope. And so logically, I know that it had no direct influence on the efforts I've been participating in. Um, logically, I know that, but still, regardless, to hear the results of the verdict did make me feel like I'm making a difference. It made me feel like that maybe the thousands of students around the country that their efforts are making a difference that Rice Black students throughout this year constantly talking about and exposing their racial traumas was somehow worth it. And that we can continue in our efforts to promote diversity, equity and inclusion and to educate about the dangers of anti-Blackness in America and at Rice. So those are my thoughts, thank you. Thank you so much, Kendall. Um, and thank, I'd like to thank all of the panelists for some really thought-provoking um, comments this evening. I have taken notes on what people said because I was just so interested in what you all had to say. So before we get to um, questions, first, I want to go ahead and acknowledge um, Danny uh, Perdue because someone wrote a, a, a question specifically for you. That's not a question. No, no, it's it's actually just a, a word of praise and I feel like you need to hear it, right? So this is from John Marsh, who is an admin in MSNE at Rice uh, in the an engineering department. And he wants to say, go, go, go to Danny Perdue. We need more black and brown and female people in PhDs in STEM. It's pretty well proven that young people are much more likely to go into fields where they can see themselves. And this is why we need Danny doing what she's doing. So I just want to I want to start us off with with a, a, a celebratory comment for Danny because you expressed a really personal um, feeling that I think uh, a lot of folks feel, and especially a lot of people in academia feel. Right, the pull to um, how does my work impact the community that I'm a part of or other communities that are disenfranchised or marginalized in some way, right? I mean, a, a lot of us have that question. So I just want to put that out there. I think that's really important for you to hear. Um, thank, you. thank you very you're much. You're welcome, <laughs> you're welcome. And you know, thank you to John Marsh for saying it. So um, we'll, we'll go to the q and I just wanted to say a couple of things that I that really struck me in terms of your comments this evening. And it's the, the re repetition of this word relief that so many of you felt relief. And I think it, which is a feeling I shared as well in all of this, but I think it goes to show how much people expected a different outcome or were prepared for a different outcome in the face of this really overwhelming evidence. Um, and that, 
you know, several of you commented on how many things had to be in place for this verdict to be the outcome. And how often is it that all of those things are in place? Um, and the last thing that I wanna point out is, you know, several of you pointed out the importance of young people in protest. And even in terms of the young, the young woman who, video, who videotaped what happened on her cell phone, right? That's a young person who took that action. And, you know, we could argue about whether or not we'd have this outcome at all without that cell phone footage. So um, with those things said, I want to turn to um, the Q&A. People started sending in questions right away, I'll have you know. So if you have more questions, please feel free to add them to the Q&A and we'll get to as many as we can in the time that we have allotted. All right, so um, one of the questions that has come up from G. Brooks is, um, that defund the police is an awesome idea with bad marketing. And how do we diffuse the obvious um, but uh, effective attempts to use it as a wedge issue, right? So if, if you just wanna, I'll throw that out there for everyone. Um, is, there a, is there a different way you would wanna talk about it? Or maybe you don't agree that defund the police is, is a good idea to begin with. So I'm just putting that idea of defund the police out there. What would you like to say about it? Do you wanna suggest chime in? Sure. Um, so my sense is that the, the premise of this question is sort of missing the point. I think uh, it's right that defund the police is not popular, um, but keep in mind that Martin Luther King before he died was incredibly unpopular. Most white Americans believe that Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was driving a wedge in this country. They believe that he was causing violent protests and riots across the country, right? Um, so no matter what messaging you use, racial issues are going to be divisive in this country. They are the primary dividing line in politics throughout the majority of this country's history. And I think you know, we could talk about other messaging strategies that might be more effective, but that's not gonna get us around the, the, the fact that this is explicitly a racial issue. And so it is going to explicitly divide people on the basis of whether they believe racism is still a problem in this country or not. I'll jump in and say, first of all, my comments trail uh, Matthew's comments, and I fully agree with that. At the same time, there is another phrase that's been around for a long time. Policy people call it justice reinvestment. And the idea has been around uh, since 2005, 2010. Texas actually engaged in a good amount of justice reinvestment, where they take money from the carceral state, from prisons, probation, parole, and from policing, and invest it in other ways. The idea is to invest it in communities, in neighborhoods that have been marginalized or oppressed, and things like that. How it actually worked wasn't quite as good. Like they seemed in Texas to take a lot of money from, uh, or some money from, prisons and things like that and send it over to the police. But the idea of justice reinvestment is to take from those areas and then invest in other areas in the community. So defund the police or disinvest in police is something that, that policy people have a different term for. I'll just add that, although I also agree with everything that Matthew said, going more deep with the issue. Would anybody else on our panel like to comment on, on the idea of defund the police or the um, immediate, in some corners, fear that comment provokes for some listeners, right? Some, some folks hear that phrase and they um, are vehemently opposed to it. Would anybody else like to, to comment on it? I don't, um, so when I originally heard def defund the police, I'm like, what, what, are, what are you doing? No one wants the police to go away, right? So, so the idea that you would say, ah, oh, defund the police, that's immediately what somebody's going to jump to. Um, I don't think it's about defunding the police. I don't think it's about bad marketing. I think the police have a problem and it's an internal problem. And, and you can take the money away, you can reinvest it in some other way, but until the police teach each other how to be decent people to stop putting up with the things that they put up with to stop put, you know, turning a blind eye to this horrible behavior. 
it won't change. You can take the money away. You can have five police officers, but if all five of them are power hungry and prepared to shoot you in the street, you're still gonna get shot in the street. So until they start educating each other, this, nothing will change. You could defund them, you can do whatever you want. They have to fix it. We can't fix it. Thank you. Well, uh, related to that is a question from Joe Graves about um, what, what people think about the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act pending in Congress, right? So here's a moment where people are trying to um, put, for, put forth policy changes in terms of what um, the police do, you know, banning particular holds and that kind of thing. Would anybody like to comment on their thoughts about um, the this the policing act, or even if there's appetite to pass this kind of legislation in the country at the moment? I'm happy to chime in as the, the political scientist and, and politics junkie. Um, I think for me, in terms of appetite for passing this, it's, I think, probably going to die in the Senate unless Joe Manchin decides that this is something that's worth ending the filibuster over because Republicans in the Senate will block it. So I think it's very, very unlikely that we'll see any action uh, on this at the federal level. This needs to be done in state legislatures. Um, I think there are some pieces of this legislation that are really, really good. Um, and, and following up on, on Angela's point, I think uh, we need police officers to get better. Uh, I think changing behavior is really, really hard but we can change incentives and people tend to respond to incentives. One of the things I like most about the federal policing legislation would be that it would end qualified immunity. So police officers, uh, when they're in the line of duty, they're basically shielded from legal or civil repercussions for their actions, right? Um, if that goes away and all of a sudden police officers are losing their pensions, if they're, they're going to be having to declare bankruptcy the same way that people have to declare bankruptcy when they can't afford their health insurance. If that's happening, all of a sudden they're going to have an incentive to um, treat communities with respect, to refrain from using force unless absolutely critically necessary. Um, for me, I think that's the biggest thing um, that we can do and that unfortunately is probably gonna have to um, happen at the state level. Thank you. I'm so glad we have a political scientist with us this evening <laughs> to answer those kinds of questions. We have time for one last question. And this is a broad, very, it's a broad question, but it's rice specific. Um, and this is from Allison Farish. What do the panelists think of the many DEI initiatives, positions, and committees at departmental school and university life? wide levels that were formed in the past year in response to these events? Does this kind of DEI work feel like a good start? Not enough. An added burden to fix racism at Rice. So I'd like to chime in because I'm one of those people that got a new job because of, of this. Um, I honestly, I, I think it is wonderful. I, I think it, it, it shows, at least in my department, an, an awakening. Um, and, and for that, um, you know, I'm, I'm relieved. I've actually done, I'm, I'm an architect by trade. Um, I, um, am a, I became a fellow in the American Institute of Architects for the work I've done in diversity inclusion related to my field. Because uh, Danny, you should be commended for, for joining STEM. Um, when I became a registered architect, I was the first one in Houston. So join and get your friends to join because it's lonely out here. Um, but, but I think what's wonderful about having this role in my department is my department spends a lot of money. And, and to have an awakening in my department to recognize that we as owners have um, some responsibility to diversify my profession in particular um, and, that, and that we can do it. You know, if, if we as owners start to feel like um, and show, show the, the, you know, the consultants that we care about diversity, then we can increase diversity within the profession. And um, I, I think the reason why that is important is because if you can increase diversity in STEM, right, um, you get to see more people of color 
in STEM positions and less maybe in the way the media likes to portray us. Um, I used to say that I wanted to make a t-shirt that said, um, stop, don't shoot, I'm just an architect, right? But there are not enough of us out there. Like I think it's important for enough black professionals to be out there where we become the norm. We become the thing that they see. So guess, so then maybe the police aren't so scared of us because I'm just an architect. I'm just a mechanical engineer. You don't need to be scared of me. You don't have to shoot me. I'd like Thank to. You. Yeah, please, JP, go ahead. <laughs> I'm on one of these committees with Andy, so I, I feel like I, I'm ready to run through a wall with her. Uh, I think for me, there's something in what she said about care. And at Rice, we talk about a culture of care. And so on one level, creating these positions is about caring. But I also want to make sure that uh, that care doesn't just stop at creation because creation doesn't mean commitment. And so for me, when we have these varied structures across campus, I think it's important to, to figure out how they align with one another, how they're interwoven, um, how much they are supported to ensure that they're not just siloed positions in a response to horrific events, because I think when those things happen, it comes off as very performative. And when it's performative, it risks doing so much more harm, especially to those underrepresented classes. Here, we're, we're focused largely on, on race. But again, if, if we look at the intersections of identity and we wanna talk about race and gender and sexual orientation and faith and ability, obviously DE&I covers a lot of different things. And those were just the identity markers I could come up with off the top of my head. But I think it's really important to ensure that while there were traumatic events that led to the care, to an, an, a, a deeper level of care, that led to the creation of these positions, that that doesn't stop there because that's certainly not enough to, to talk about commitment. So for me, it's about making sure that I use the platform, I use the opportunities that I've had to leverage these relationships across campus so that we can form those webs, form deeper relationships to ensure that that culture of care becomes more inclusive, more equitable, and quite frankly, recognizes all of the diversity that we have, doesn't just stop at racial diversity or doesn't just stop at gender or sexual orientation diversity and really embraces all of the uniqueness that we have in our, in our environment, in our community, because I think that's where we ultimately can win. And that's where we can do our part to ensure that we're making this world what we, we hope to see someday. Uh I'm going to put Kendall on the spot and ask her if she wants the last word on this before we turn things back over to Dr. Bird, since she brings to us the perspective of a student who's experiencing the creation of these different offices, if she feels like it's changing her experience at the university or her opinion of the university. So Kendall, if you don't mind. No, thank you. I was going to see if I should shoot my hand up or something to get my thought in on this. Um, so thank you. I feel like to ask if it's a start, it's a start. And I think that it's good because it's a start. I think that it won't be enough until, until it's not enough. But I do feel the fact that this past year, just seeing these starts, seeing these positions being created, to see the formation of these new courses. And it's something that students can see. And of course, since it's a start, there's gonna be a lot of questions and we have a lot of questions. We are questioning like, is this good? Is this enough, you know? But I do feel as though a huge part of creating change is to start from somewhere, right? And so, I don't want to like minimalize this into at least we're doing some things and something's better than nothing. That's not what I'm trying to say. But what I am trying to say is that I don't think that the start of these initiatives of these positions of these committees is a burden. And I don't think that it's an added burden. I do think that it is something that's necessary and that is showing students that, you know, although it's like, yes, hype up the young people, we want to work, we want to 
engage in protests. We want to um, help to spread education throughout our communities. We want to do that, you know, we can't do that alone. And it's going to take all of us as a community to quote unquote, fix racism at Rice, if that's even possible. And so what do I think of them? I think that they're wonderful. I think that it's great that they're, that they've happened and that they're happening. Um, I've been a part of some of those efforts, like um, with helping to create this new course that would help students coming in to learn about what diversity means and what it means at Rice and how to interact with people who don't come from the same backgrounds as you. Like, this is great. You know, people can throw around the word performative and question, you know, the longevity of some of these programs or some of these positions all they want. But I feel like having this done is not just a start, but it is the start to a commitment of proving that commitment. Because I think that that's where we're at now is that, okay, we're seeing the creation of these things, but we want to make sure that like, um, I forgot, I apologize, I forgot who made this comment earlier, but um, along the same veins of that, you know, making sure that there is work done in addition to these so that we can continue to see the effects from these, which we're not gonna see short-term for a lot of these, but that we anticipate to see, so. Thank you. Um, with that, I will turn things back over to Dr. Bird because we are, I know we're a little bit over time. And so Dr. Bird, uh, again, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for your wonderful comments and for your answers to these questions. Dr. Bird. Thanks, Dr. Yarbrough, and thanks all of you on the panel and all of you in the audience that I got to see. Uh, and I'm excited um, to see so many students, so many in leadership at the university. Um, and I've been here long enough that I could also get excited about seeing so many alumni um, who somehow um, found this link and, and, and jumped on board. Um, it is my hope that we will do other panels along th this line, um, things that we'll have a little more time to, to plan and, and, and think about. Uh, and so we, we hope that you'll um, watch this space or that space out there where you found, about, found out about this for, for what's coming next. Um, I have put um, something in the chat that I, I hope you'll click on right after we close in 35 seconds about an event that our Department of Transnational Asian Studies and the Office of the Provost are hosting tomorrow, um, featuring a phenomenal essayist and poet, Kathy Park Hong, who will be in conversation with Rice students and faculty um, about her most recent publication um, that addresses many of the issues that we've been um, speaking about tonight. Um, her um, latest book is Minor Feelings, an Asian American Reckoning. Uh, and I hope to see all of you there um, tomorrow, same time, 6.30, same place on Zoom. Uh, and again, um, thank you so much for joining us tonight for your friends who couldn't make it, or for those of you who want to watch this again, um, keep an eye out on the task force website. Um, we will post the recording of the webinar. Uh, again, thanks so much uh, and good night.